Triple C, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope you had a great week. I've had quite a busy week myself. I've was down in Wyoming giving a couple presentations down there and then I had to travel all the way out to the western end of Montana out in Missoula and gave a presentation there and then drove drove home so that was a, a pretty uh, rigorous Tuesday through Friday so some serious hours being driven I think we're looking at 12 21 hours of driving does that sound right I think it was nine in 12, yeah, 21, 21 hours of driving in four days. So uh, it was uh, it was quite a trip. Got a chance to see some, some pretty country. And, and believe it or not, Wyoming is an emptier state than Montana, even though we are a larger, uh, ge- we have larger geography. Boy, it's uh, quite an empty area. So if you want a place where you can spread your wings, um, I can tell you Wyoming would be a place to go, but man, it is dry down there, and certainly in the eastern end that I was in, to be sure. So um, nevertheless, I was really grateful for the opportunities and uh, uh, had a chance to uh, meet someone that I haven't seen in a while. So that was, um, I think that was overall positive, although it certain, certainly could have been better, but uh, I'll stay out of the uh, inside baseball there but well anyways glad to have you on board do take a few moments if you would to uh, subscribe to the channel make sure you ring the bell as well as to make sure you're subscribers so that you don't lose any access to the podcast that I'm doing here also if you're looking for something that's not necessarily related to uh, YouTube I do publish these presentations up on the alternative namely rumble so you can visit me there just go to wildlife control consultant and download the podcast there all right well uh we have today i wanted to talk a little bit about euthanasia specifically the carbon carbon dioxide method now those of you that have been following my podcast for the last four years will know that I've talked about this particular problem before, and that is a lot of you, I would suspect, are using carbon dioxide as a way to put down your animals. And uh, you're probably telling your clients that it is a humane method of controlling wildlife. And that is kind of true. Um, It's, I've explained in the past that the AVMA has a different definition of what humane is. So let's kind of go through some of that as a review. So some of the, if you haven't gone back and listened to my earlier presentations, this will be uh, new to you. For those of you who heard before, this will be a little bit of a refresher. Then we're gonna drill down a little bit into an article I found uh, from 2006 on the issue of carbon dioxide. So let's take a look at that. So we have different definitions of humane. So it's an adjective. It's basically looking at here from a dictionary definition. It's characterized by tenderness and compassion and sympathy for animals, particularly those that are suffering and distressed, namely euthanizing a terminally sick pet. Another way of defining it, uh, the second definition of humane, is acting in a manner that causes the least harm to animals, such as humane trapping of stray pets. Our focus for the use of the word humane is going to be on the second definition. So rather than just being an adnitudinal position, it's going to be how we behave toward animals. So we have this problem of what's called the semantic overlap. Now, semantic is just a fancy word meaning what a word means, how words are defined and understood. And so humane, when we say uh, something is humane, that is a broader category talking about how animals are treated. Euthanasia is a narrow definition about how an animal is killed, but that is within the confines of what we're referring to by humane treatment. 
So euthanasia is a subcategory of how we humanely treat animals. So we're all concerned about this, of course. Let me go back here. So a lot of our organizations are concerned about this, to be sure. So what are our options about dealing with animals? Well, when we have, when we capture animals or trying to remove them, we have a variety of different ways of handling them, right? We're not always killing animals. They could be released, they can be translocated, they can be relocated, or we can kill them namely by euthanasia or the concept of humane killing, which is a fast form of killing, but where the animal is able to still suffer. So how do we treat animals humanely? And so we have two different definitions of euthanasia here. Just like we had two different definitions of what the word humane was, we also have two definitions of the word euthanasia. So the first definition is a mercy killing, and that is we're killing the animal for its benefit. In other words, it's it's in a, maybe it got hit by a car, or it's got mange, and it's just too far gone. We're putting it out of its misery. The second definition of euthanasia is essentially meaning a painless death, and that is while the animal is dying, the animal is not experiencing distress or pain. That would be the second definition of euthanasia. So when we're talking about euthanasia here, we're primarily focusing on painless death. And so this is important for you to understand because the AVMA has a different definition of euthanasia. Their definition of euthanasia combines the mercy killing along with the painless death. They, they use both of those in their definition. So in other words, if you're killing an animal just because it's bothering you, that would not be considered euthanasia according to the AVMA standard. The AVMA standard is we are killing this animal for the interests of the animal, not the interests of the client. We're killing them for the interests of the animal. And the death must be rapid, painless, and distress-free. Those two elements have to be there in order for it to be considered euthanasia by the AVMA definition. This is why I've been pounding the table, figuratively speaking, begging the industry to stop using the word euthanasia unless they're defining it because a lot of people, I follow AVMA guidelines. The answer is no, you don't. You don't follow the AVMA guidelines. Reason is you are killing animals, not for the animal's benefit, but for your client's benefit. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't examples or instances where you are killing the animal for its benefit. But you and I know that 99% of the time when you are killing an animal that's that you're for a client, you're doing it for the client, not for the animal's benefit. And so we're not following the AVMA here. And just so that you know, the 2020 AVMA definition follows the same pattern as the 2013 definition, right? Animal's interest, rapid, painless, distress for Both characteristics must be there in order to call it euthanasia. So what do we practice as wildlife control operators? Well, we don't care about the animal's interests as a general rule, we're looking for the customer's interest and we want a method that's rapid, painless, distress-free. I mean, to be fair, wildlife control operators don't make any more money by seeing how much agony they can put an animal through, all right? So let's be, let's be fair about that, right? I, don't, I haven't found many people in wildlife control who just get off on seeing how much they can cause animals to suffer. Okay, now, are there a few? Yeah, I think there would be a few, just like there's people that are just have a, a broken moral compass in every field, right? So the reality is, but generally speaking, wildlife control operators, if you gave them a method that was rapid, painless, free, distress-free, convenient, and cost-effective, because they are running a business, they would love to use it, all right? And they care about the customer's interests, and for them, that would be what euthanasia is. So when we, so when a wildlife control operator refers to euthanasia, we're not interested in the animal's interest. We're interested in the client's interest and our ability to kill the animal quickly and painlessly. 
Okay, so you can see how the AVMA has a different definition of euthanasia than the wildlife control industry. Okay, so a lot of this is going to be review. Those of you who've heard me before, and for those of you who haven't, this is certainly going to be going to be new. So just to, to summarize, then, wildlife control operators. Their definition, when we use the term, we typically mean an animal is dying without pain or is distress, and it's convenient and cost-effective. And carbon dioxide has been the primary method by which we have been able to fulfill that. Now, because the AVMA defines, they're the, they're the big dog in the room, they're the ones who are telling us whether a particular method is pain and distress-free. And they have the scientific community that helps them determine those sorts of things. And wildlife control operators for years have now been doing this. This has been going on at least since the, the late 1980s. Uh, perhaps maybe the 90s. Uh, maybe the 90s would be a better definition. I know I think I've been, I was using it at least in the 90s. I don't recall if I was using it in the 80s or not. But nevertheless, at least in the early 1990s, while the industry began to adopt, not everywhere instantly, but as a rule, the industry was increasingly adopting the use of carbon dioxide as the method to control animals. If we needed to put an animal down in a cage, we would drop it into a carbon dioxide chamber and apply it. So when we're talking about the euthanasia regimen or the pre-euthanasia regimen, we have to understand that the AVMA wants us to be thinking about how we're treating an animal before we begin administering the euthanasia agent. So this means you have to be thinking about if you have a squirrel, you don't put the squirrel cage next to a raccoon cage, right? So because a raccoon, the squirrel will be scared scared out of its wits next to a predator like a raccoon. So you have to be thinking about keeping the animal calm and relaxed and, and warm and not necessarily over warm or, or hot and, and not in distress before you putting it into the euthanasia chamber. Okay, so here's an example of a euthanasia chamber. This is one that I had back in the day. Now you can certainly build yours. A lot of people use, use basically plywood the beauty of carbon dioxide chambers is carbon dioxide is heavier than air. So you only need it you only need a box large enough to handle your cage and it only needs to be sealed along the lower the lower portions up to the top and at the top you actually don't want it to be sealed because when you're applying when you're inserting carbon dioxide at the bottom like you can see the little nipple in the lower right hand corner here, move my cursor around there. When you're when you have the gas entering there, it's pushing out the atmospheric air out the top. And so you don't need a airtight seal at the top of this chamber. You just need it airtight along the walls and along the base. But on the top portion, you don't want it secure. Just simply a cover. In the so that it pushes the good air or the atmospheric air out as the carbon dioxide is moving in. And as it fills with carbon dioxide, there's less oxygen until finally the carbon dioxide displaces the oxygen. So you all know that when we're breathing air, air is around 20% CO oxygen and only a, few, a, a small percentage of carbon dioxide. Well, if you flip that, so now it's 100% carbon dioxide as opposed to 20% oxygen, the person will be, the person or organism will be breathing gas, but there's no car exchange from the lungs to the outside world of carbon dioxide to the outside world because there's no oxygen there. So the, basically the person starves of oxygen. And that's what carbon dioxide does. So if you're only breathing carbon dioxide, you you don't ha you have a basically an inert that is a chemical compound that doesn't interact with our bloodstream, and so we're, our body is isn't able to throw off the carbon dioxide 
and take on the oxygen because there's no oxygen there. Well, the animal is undergoing the same thing. And that's essentially how carbon dioxide kills. Carbon dioxide kills by basically suffocating an animal without choking it. It's just simply not allowing it to breathe oxygen because there's no longer oxygen in the chamber. And so essentially, we've been teaching people historically that you fill the chamber at about a 20% CO2 per minute. So in the space of five minutes, the chamber would fill with carbon dioxide gas and the animal would ultimately succumb. And that's a basically the end of it. And we were thinking that this was going to be a humane way to kill an animal without pain and distress because carbon dioxide was believed to have uh, basically a, sedentary, uh, a sedative effect. And that is as the animal was breathing carbon dioxide, it would actually suppress its ability to feel pain. And then it would eventually just go to sleep and that would be the end of it. And the heart would eventually stop because the heart ran out of oxygen. And that was it. That was the belief. Unfortunately, newer research has occurred that has raised questions about whether or not carbon dioxide could continue to be considered as a form of euthanasia. Remember what the, euthanasia, what the definition of euthanasia was at its bare minimum, it meant that the animal was dying without pain or distress. That's what distinguishes it from humane killing. So does an animal who that's exposed to carbon dioxide, does it experience pain and distress? Well, yes, it kind of does. So let's talk a little bit. There was a, basically a meeting that occurred and the title of the meeting was the Newcastle Consensus Meeting on Carbon Dioxide Euthanasia of Laboratory Animals. And this meeting took place on February 27th to February 28th in 2006. It took place at the University of Newcastle, which was located in Tyne, the United Kingdom, T-Y-N-E, UK, United Kingdom. So essentially, as you have a series of experts who came together and people interested in animal welfare and laboratory technicians and all the like of that, came together and had a meeting about carbon dioxide and its use in euthanizing laboratory animals. And they came up with some principles there. Now, the reason why I'm going into this is because I believe that some of the findings from this particular meeting were incorporated in the 2020 uh, euthanasia guidelines from the AVMA. Now, they may not have been cited specifically, but certainly the concepts that were mentioned here were, a, were brought into the AVMA guidelines. So the AVMA made the decision that said carbon dioxide is still considered kind of like a euthanasia method, but it's kind of like on, on probation, maybe a win way to phrase it. That would be kind of a, a way to phrase it. So yeah, it still meets the criterion, but questions are being raised about whether it does. And let's talk about a few of those here. What the findings were of this Newcastle group that was meeting, again, Newcastle was a university in the UK, what they found was, is that there was no ideal method of killing with carbon dioxide. And they even said that an optimum filling method was unknown to them. Now, optimal means a filling method that says that if you fill the chamber at this particular rate, displacing the regular room air at a particular rate, the animal would not experience pain. And what they found is they couldn't figure out what that rate was. And here's what they said. Animals that are placed into pre-filled chambers with at least 50% CO2 experienced pain for 10 to 15 seconds. 
Now, why are they experiencing pain? Well, the reason they are experiencing pain is because when they're exposed to that high concentration of carbon dioxide, it actually creates carbon, carbon, carbonic acid, excuse me, inside their nasal passages, causing it to burn. Just think of a situation where when you were drinking soda and it went up your nose, what was the burning like? Well, that acidity is from the carbon dioxide meeting the moisture in your nose causing acid to form, carbonic acid. And so you may have seen this in animals. If you were watching them, sometimes they'll shake their head or sneeze or something. And this is that carbonic acid taking its effect. So some of you may have been pre-filling your chambers so that the animal dies faster. And that is certainly true. You drop an animal like a raccoon into pure CO2 gas, it will die really quick. Same way if you do that with the juveniles. However, the animal is experiencing pain. And that means it doesn't meet the standard of the AVMA, meaning euthanasia is killing an animal without pain. So the second thing, well, what if we did it at a lower level? Because you say, well, Stephen, you mentioned filling the chamber at 20% per minute overcame that particular problem. Well, no, not really. And because what they found in this particular meeting was that if you placed an animal into rising CO2 levels, so you put the animal into a chamber, it has room air in it, and then you displace that air with filling it with CO2 at a rising level, that they found that the animals were, were, it became aversive. In other words, animals avoided the gas. How did they know this? Well, one of the tests they did was they had food in the chamber that was sort of filled, and that area around the food was filled with CO2, and they found that the animals didn't want to go into the room with CO2 with the food. That's aversive, right? The, it means the animal's not liking that carbon dioxide. And they found that animals that are exposed to rising levels of carbon dioxide may experience, again, they're using a lot of fudgy words here, may, could, possibly, because we, don't, we can't get into the head of an animal, right? We have to only look at the behavior of the animal to and sort of infer underlying suffering or not right and they, and they recognize that that's a complicated thing because they also pointed out that there are times where an animal's behavior may look bad but that there's no suffering going on because the animal's already unconscious right so they're so they're not just don't just treat these folks as being you know hardcore animal rights activists that's not true there are, these are laboratory individuals, and they're trying to find ways that because you have, to, you have to kill laboratory animals. How do we do this where there is no as where there is no pain or suffering for that laboratory animal? And what they're finding is that they haven't been able to find that with CO2. And so they said sometimes these animals, when they're placed in chambers and the and the carbon dioxide level is rising, some of them are exhibiting evidence that they're experiencing what's called air hunger that is you just can't catch your breath you're you're trying to you're trying to breathe but you're not getting what you need out of it and then also dyspnea which is just difficulty breathing which certainly makes sense if you're breathing gas and you're not getting the feeling of like you know if you take a deep breath it kind of wakes you up a little bit and you get a little bit more clear-headed well, if you're breathing in deep and you're not getting your head cleared because it's all full of carbon dioxide, you're going to feel that air hunger and the stress of like, I'm not getting the oxygen I need to survive. And they're saying that the animals are feeling this. Well, how do we know that the animals are feeling pain when they get into various carbon dioxide concentrations? Well, they argued that they believe and that there's evidence for that the nociceptors, these are the pain indicators, the nerves involved in pain indication, are very similar in humans and in rats and in other animals. So what they had is an experiment where they took human subjects and exposed them to one breath 
through their nose, breathing carbon dioxide at various concentrations. So when they breathed pure oxygen, 40 of them did not find it unpleasant. When they breathed a 50% CO2, four of them didn't find it unpleasant, 15 found it unpleasant, 14 found it uncomfortable, and seven found it painful. At a 60% concentration of CO2, and remember, they're only taking in one breath with their nose, one, uh, three didn't find it unpleasant, seven found it unpleasant, 18 found it uncomfortable, and 12 found it painful. So you'll notice here, as the concentration of CO2 increases, the reports from the human subjects go from unpleasant to more increasingly painful. So the higher the concentration of carbon dioxide, the more likely the human subject would complain of pain. Well, that doesn't bode well for whether CO2 can be considered a euthanasia technique. This is a problem. Why am I mentioning this? We as an industry have got to start thinking about what policies we're going to support about animal euthanasia and humane killing. We need, as an industry, to begin to create our own white papers, perform our own research, and begin to become politically active in this particular area. We also need to stop, or use with caution, maybe stop is too strong of a word, we need to start thinking carefully about how close we want to identify our euthanasia with the AVMA. I have argued previously the AVMA is not necessarily a friend of the wildlife control industry. Their interests don't align with our interests. And if we're not careful, we may find ourselves facing legislation that bans the forms of killing, animal killing that we're using. Whether it's carbon dioxide, and what happens is, is if we can't use carbon dioxide, what are we going to use? We can't get access to the narcotics, and it's highly unlikely that the legislature or various regulatory agencies will give us the narcotics to meet the AVMA standards in terms of their best management practices. So right now, I'm, I'm telling you that our use of carbon dioxide is still on very shaky ground, and it's not unheard of to think of that we could lose carbon dioxide as a euthanasia technique. It'll always be a humane killing technique. I doubt we'll lose that. But whether it's a humane technique for euthanasia, I mean a, uh, a euthanasia technique for killing animals, that remains to be seen whether we'll, how long we're going to continue that. So it's very possible within the next 10 years that we could lose it, and that it could be drawn down to a secondary mode of killing, typically after the animal's already unconscious. Now, unless you're wanting to use a blow to the head all the time, and you, how, how convenient is that? Are we going to be able to put a, you know, take a raccoon in a cage? Are we going to have to put him into a squeeze box and then hit him in the head and then put him in carbon dioxide? Do you really want this sort of a hassle? As an industry, we have need to get our associations on board to be thinking about this. Training is important, but we also need to be thinking about policy and lobbying efforts to find a path forward because if we're not responding to the claims of the AVMA and other animal activists or animal welfareists. I think the AVMA is more of an animal welfareist rather than animal rights per se. But nevertheless, there are all kinds of shades out there. We, you, If we don't protect what we're doing, it's very likely we could lose it. And things can happen faster than you think. I know you're busy. I know you don't want to hear about politics. I know it doesn't make you money. 
but you have got to be looking at your associations and saying, what are we paying for? Who are we paying enough to start looking at the lobbying elements and start putting together position papers and thinking about these things? Because if we don't have a way to kill these animals, what are we going to do? This is a real problem. So I'm just letting you know that I think carbon dioxide, its future is unclear. And it could be that we could lose this as a euthanasia technique down the road, particularly if the AVMA changes its stance toward carbon dioxide. And it's already, I'm telling you, I'm already seeing elements that it's beginning to, that it's shifting. You've been warned. I'm sorry this is bad news. We don't always have a lot of great news in the wildlife control industry, although we'll talk about some, I'm sure. Nevertheless, think long and hard of this and think about how are you marketing yourself. You have a lot of people have on their trucks humane wildlife control or humane this or, you know, are you really? Well, who's defining what that word means? And if we don't have our own definition, we may find clients who find out the truth or what they thought, what the, how they interpreted your words is different than how, what you meant by it. And that makes for a very angry client. So you need to be sure that we're accurate in what we're telling the public about our treatment of animals. This is a, an important topic. It's a complex topic. And it's certainly a controversial topic. We need to be thinking about how we're going to deal with this particular issue. And I'm arguing that the industry has not been doing its job on dealing with this issue. It's time to start. All right. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Do take a few moments, if you would. Drop me a line if you have questions, thoughts. Reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. You can also reach me, of course, with, there's my telephone number. You can also reach me. But if you're calling, um, please uh, leave a message. I don't always pick up the phone. I get a lot of spam in my particular uh, work. But you can certainly uh, reach out and uh, contact me if you would. I don't like uh, Facebook Messenger very well. I prefer email. But nevertheless, you can see me on Facebook. Do join us in our Pest Geek podcast family there with our Facebook page, questions, thoughts, issues. And uh, do do want to thank people. I did get a hold of some Norway rat scat, so I'm very pleased about that. I am looking for a bushy tail wood rat scat. I'm definitely looking for that. I'm also looking, of course, for photos. If you have photos that you would like to sell the usage rights to, uh, not buying ownership, you can certainly sell your photos to someone else. I'm just looking to buy use rights. And I'm also looking for someone who can do some line drawing for me. So if you know someone who can do some line drawing, I'd be very interested in that as well. You can certainly reach out to me. Hope you've enjoyed this particular podcast, even though it's not quite as positive as I would like. These are important issues, and we need to be thinking about them for the future so that we have our, we can protect our industry. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because I want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.